hello, I'm Laura Stack. I am the CEO and founder of Johnny's Ambassadors and very blessed uh, to be able to educate parents and teens about the dangers of today's high potency THC products, especially on adolescent brain development, mental illness and suicide. And so to do that today, I am uh, going to start uh, with a session on the dangerous truth about today's marijuana. And I'm going to tell you about my son, Johnny Stack um, and his life and death story and where Johnny's ambassadors came from. Um, I wanna begin by saying suicide is a, a very emotional topic. If this is um, triggering to you and, and by discussing this, this brings up some emotion or feeling, please uh, disconnect uh, from the webinar, reach out to someone, get some help if necessary. Um, call the National Suicide Hotline, it's 800-273-TALK. And I believe, by the way, everyone should have that phone number in your contacts um, because you never know when you're going to need it um, to be able to help someone. Um, so I don't know what you think of when you think of a, a person with a drug addiction. I know all of us are in, um, you know, interested in marijuana um, prevention for youths who are on this call. Uh, and you know what you think of, do you think of a person who's experiencing homelessness? Do you think of a person um, in trouble with the law? Perhaps you think of someone um, who came from a disadvantaged uh, background. This is who I think of. This is my son, Johnny. This is a picture of him at uh, 17 years of age when he was uh, caught in the throes of addiction. Here, we are in Hawaii on a very long vacation and he was not able uh, to use marijuana. This was a challenging uh, vacation, although you see his big smile here. He was always, um, as a child, happy, uh, smiling, full of life. He was intelligent. He had a 4.0 a GPA. He had a scholarship to Colorado State University. He was a math genius. He got a perfect 800 out of 800 on the math portion of the SAT. Um, we're Christian, we grew, grew up, uh, we live in a, a suburb of Denver. You know, he, he was a brown belt in karate. He took piano lessons. He ran cross country. He was just your regular old kid. Um, and sadly, he was also addicted uh, to marijuana. On November 21st, on 2019 at 103 a.m. So um, it was just after he had killed himself in our living room, the coroner told us, Mr. and Mrs. Stack, I'm with the coroner's office and I'm so sorry to tell you that your son is deceased. <laughs> and that was the worst time of my entire life. Um, you know, and I, I think if my husband and I can make it through that, that horrible, horrible night, I figure we can, we can make it through anything. Um, and we're so passionate about sharing the story and obviously it's still um, fresh um, and very emotional for me, but I am so determined um, that other teens don't take this path. And I thank you uh, for being here uh, to help us with this. So, so what happened? Okay, so let's just talk about um, what happened and dabbing. So in 2012, Colorado was, the first state to legalize recreational marijuana. We talked about that. And in 2014, all the products came out onto the market. Well, at that point, Johnny was in ninth grade and pot was everywhere. Um, at every high school party, it was very easy to get. And his friend had a brother who was 18 and um, a senior in high school and got a med card, which we'll talk about was very easy to get. And so he used marijuana, uh, and told us that he did. He came home from the party and said, you know, there was marijuana at the party. And, you know, just like any parent, we we always said, don't use marijuana. It's bad for your brain. But um, he was he was honest and he told us and we told him in no uncertain terms was he to use it ever again. And it was not allowed. And so he just didn't tell us. So maybe that wasn't um, the best approach at the time. But I need you to, you know, understand that when this happened in 2014, there were all these new products out onto the market um, called dabs, and we had no idea what dabs were. And so, you know, we're not talking about this really bad um, dance move. When people say today, you know, he's dabbing, she's dabbing, 
Do you even know what that means? So dabs mean that it's an extract of marijuana. All right, so there's a person who, and it doesn't have to be a chemist, it can be someone in their home, runs a solvent through um, the cannabis plant, like butane. So this makes the THC, the tetrahydrocannabinol, which is the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana that makes you high, it makes it leave the plant and it dissolves into the solvent. So now you have this concentrated THC with the solvent, and then it's filtered to attempt to remove as much of the solvent as possible, and it's dried in a tray. And it looks like a sticky um, beeswax or earwax disgusting um, kind of substance. It can be further processed into a more um, pure uh, distillate. So be very clear, this is a chemical. Okay, this is no longer a plant. This is just the chemical of the psychoactive ingredient and it can be up to 99% potent. Then they're heated on a hot surface and inhaled. So this is what some of these products look like. This is what we're dealing with today. So people who used marijuana like I did um, when I was a teen in the 80s, you know, where you would roll your grass into a joint um, and, and smoke it. There are still flowers, but even the flower is very potent. It used to be two to 5% um, THC in the flower. Today's flower can be upwards of 40% THC just in the flower, which they used to think was impossible to cultivate, but it, the plant can hold that. Um, through different cultivation methods. These are, um, you know, crumble. They're usually named by their consistency, how they're processed and uh, what they look like. So whether it's batter, um, shatter, which is uh, literally brittle, uh, maybe it's a distillate. These are used in carts and, and uh, vapes, pens that are used to dab these very high potency uh, THC extracts. Crystal is very much like crack. Uh, it's used uh, with a crack pipe, actually. Um, dry sift has trichomes, which are the part of the plant that actually contain uh, the THC rosin, which is squished, the plant is squished under pressure, um, and that's what uh, remains, and bubble hash is made with water uh, instead. So these are not plants, and it's very important that when kids say, ah, you know, you used to smoke, it's like, we're not even talking anywhere near um, about the same thing. So a shatter like this is taken, heated, a nail is heated or the device um, that's being used, a tiny, tiny piece of the shatter um, is broken off, touched to that nail um, so that it now forms a vapor, it vaporizes that shatter and then it's inhaled. And so this is a rig and, and spend some time, go on Google and Google, um, you know, dab rig and you will be shocked. I'm not going to, you know, give this person any exposure, but you can find these videos on, um, on YouTube. So this is not a natural product. Okay. This is not God made this. It's from, it's from nature just in the same way that you can take a coca plant um, and, and turn it into cocaine and then turn it into crack, all right? You can take a cannabis plant, have marijuana, which means by definition, it has greater than 0.3% uh, THC that um, is not hemp, right? It's marijuana, greater than 0.3% THC, and you can now turn it into THC crystals. So if you think of any other drug um, that you can consume in a rock form, like this, you can use a crack pipe to smoke nearly pure um, THC. So here's a picture of um, gummies uh, that were blown into my yard here in a suburb here in Highlands Ranch. You see that the total THC is 1,009 uh, milligrams. Understand that in Colorado, legally, one serving of an edible is 10 milligrams. So in this packet, you get 20 gummies, 50 milligrams each. What, are they gonna just take a fifth of a gummy off and eat that? No, so this, even though there's like serving sizes, there are, can you imagine if a child ate the package of 20 gummies with a thousand milligrams in them, they would be in the emergency room. 
So just how you understand um, kind of average serving size, I got this off of um, a pot website um, so that you can understand the differences. So in an edible, um, and it depends on the state that you're in, but again, here in Colorado, a serving is 10 milligrams. So let's say you ate a brownie, okay? So a brownie would have 10 milligrams of THC in it. So if you have a bowl, let's say you have a quarter gram of flour, uh, let's give it 18% potency, you lose some of that to burning, right? Because it's being burned in the leaves. So they're estimating about 18 milligrams of THC in there of 0.4 gram in a joint, right? You need more pot and you roll it, but it, you lose less of it when you're smoking a joint compared to a bowl. I have learned so much, I tell you. Um, so here you're gonna get about 36 milligrams if you smoke a joint. Now, if you smoke a vape, a THC vape with these distillates in it, right? If you get a cart, it's called, which is a gram of vape. Let's say there's 200 puffs. Um, in a cart. And let's say the potency is 80%. So if it's a gram, 80%, by definition, you have 800 milligrams in that cart. So for every puff, you're taking four milligrams, four milligrams, four milligrams. And this is what Johnny sadly was doing all day, uh, was vaping and also using dabs. So let's assume you have a gram of wax, all right? So let's say if you have 80%, uh, potency, which there are higher. Uh, now you still have 800 milligrams, but let's say in a gram of dab, um, you're going to have eight servings of that. So you're taking 100 milligrams per serving, all right, per dab versus if you do a joint, it's 36 for an entire joint versus 100 for a dab. So very, very potent. Um, it really critical to understand. And this is what the kids are using. You guys, this is, it's not, you have to think beyond weed. All right, here's a hash oil syringe. They're putting them into beverages. Um, beer companies are getting involved. Coors, you know, they're gonna make, you know, the mile high drinks. There's other um, beer uh, companies that are getting involved. And um, also of course, big tobacco getting involved. We have elixirs, we have salad dressing infused tampons what who knew um that our our teens would be using tampons suppositories um to get high and oils the edibles of all kinds um are available and sadly some of them you can't even recognize as having thc and kids that can't read who are you know parents are using these who are themselves impaired are not as careful. So they're leaving them out. Kids are getting hold of these. And these things clearly appeal uh, to youth. They're trying to market um, to our youth. So in Colorado, um, this is from the 2019 uh, data. It came out in 2020 called uh, Monitoring Health Concerns Related to Marijuana in Colorado. This is from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. You can see um, the prevalence of, uh, in this graph here, let me see if I can pull up, um, here we go, a laser pointer and show you. So here is the smoking, right, graph. You see this going down. Oh, isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? No, it's not great and not wonderful because the green line from 2015, woo, to 2019, dabbing is going way up. Um, vaping uh, here, red is going up, right? And so this is this is a problem because the incidence of the use is now more potent and higher frequency. This is a very dangerous formula uh, for our youth. Why? Because of the way that their brains form. Three things happen. First, uh, when your brain is forming, something called synaptogenesis. I know that's crazy. Um, but basically, the brain, when formed, is a big jumble of, of wire. Like, think of it like a jungle, right? And it's just a big ball of vines. So the brain's first job is to make connections between the synapses and try to make sense of this big jumble, all right? So that is going on. Um, and until adolescence. At that point, um, apoptosis 
is pruning. So pruning means use it or lose it. If you're not going to use the pathway that was formed, say, to play the piano, you're, you don't play the piano, you're not going to use that pathway, your brain will prune that in an attempt to make the brain more efficient. It doesn't need all of those connections that were first put there um, until it knew what that human was going to do. So this is what allows the specialization of the brain and why some people who put their emphasis, say, on um, playing an instrument, right, or math, or dribbling a ball and doing free throws, right? Your brain is pruning away all the other stuff that it's not using when you're growing. And then this process of myelination, which is making those pathways stronger, right? So if there's drug use being done, the process of getting, using, buying, recovering from marijuana use, that whole learning experience is then myelinated. So the brain actually kind of forms insulation around the pathways that it's using over and over and over again so that it can access and speed up transmission in that particular pathway. So this is what's supposed to be happening in the brain. Um, here's what the brain looks like. Many of you have probably seen this graph. Starting at age five to age 20, um, the brain continues to form until the mid-20s for girls and to the late 20s, some are even saying 30 years old uh, for men. So the, the gray matter, which is represented by the blue, has not fully formed um, until that age. So this is an image of a five-year-old brain. And so when marijuana is applied to the brain, this process is actually interrupted. This is the brain actually forming. It's a sped up version of the brain from ages five through 20. Isn't that fascinating? So this is what we need the brain to be able to do uninterrupted. Sadly, when marijuana is introduced, marijuana uh, tricks the brain because the molecule of THC looks amazingly like one of our natural molecules called anandamide, which when you, let's say, get the runner's high, that's what makes you feel good. And so the THC molecule clicks into the brain called the CB1 uh, receptor in the endocannabinoid system, which you see marked here uh, in the brain. And it binds to it and it disrupts our natural endocannabinoids from being able to get into the brain. And it causes all kinds of problems when the adolescent mind is supposed to be forming. Um, you have all these handouts. I'm not going to go through this, but I want you to see just how the brain parts, you know, are labeled, the prefrontal cortex, uh, right in the front that's supposed to have your executive function uh, in them. When THC binds to that, now it can't do its job, it can't form correctly, it's actually stunted or arrested, what's called hypofrontality. Now you have increased impulsiveness, reduces your judgment, you have problems in decision-making, um, risky behavior, all of these things you've probably seen in a youth who is using marijuana. Um, Dr. Paula Riggs from Denver Health, just here up, uh, up in Denver, did a webinar uh, for Johnny's Ambassadors, which we do every Friday, uh, and she calls it neurotoxic. Um, neurotoxic. It literally causes brain damage. So with all this happening to the brain, um, and I want to encourage you to go uh, in your notes, I know you're hopefully taking notes today, go to johnny'sambassadors.org, our website, slash fact or fiction, fact or fiction. Uh, we made a game that I want you to play with your teens, okay? There's a game board, we call it fact or crap. Uh, you're gonna quiz your teen and the research is in here so that you can go to those links and you can actually read about what marijuana does to adolescents. Marijuana dependence decreases IQ. This is, this is scientific, this is not just uh, you know, some person guessing that this does this. These are peer-reviewed journal science studies, okay? 
um, increases addiction, and our speakers are gonna cover many of these things today. Increases the odds you'll use other drugs, it can kill you if you throw up enough with hyper, um, um, hyperemesis syndrome, you're more likely to drop out of school, can result in psychosis and schizophrenia, sadly what happened to Johnny. Decreases your fertility rates. It's not just CB1 receptors in the brain, there are CB2 receptors throughout your body, your gut, including your reproductive system. Uh, it lowers your motivation to do things. It makes you paranoid. It thinks you makes you think others intend to harm you. Damages your overall health. It's really bad for your cardiovascular system and your heart, and it makes you a worse driver. These things are proven. Um, so please go to that page uh, at some point and play that game uh, with the teens that you know. So. In 2016, Johnny started driving. Um, John and I saw a lot of mood changes, uh, anxiety, a lot of um, defiance, just not wanting to follow the rules. And he started to unravel. Um, in his senior year, when he began his senior year, um, he ran away for a few weeks. There was, um, sadly, a lot of verbal abuse. I write about this in my book um, coming up. Very, very difficult. Uh, vaping in the house um, in in defiance. And in 2018, when he turned 18, um, he left. He moved out of the house. And, you know, we still had James in the house. It was a really bad um, situation. And so we uh, thought we agreed with him that that would probably be the best idea. And that's where, oh my, all kinds of um, use he started dealing because uh, he got his med card at his uh, 18th birthday and he wasn't at home. We were unaware of this happening. He had a lot of legal troubles. We tried to help uh, as much as possible, always supporting, always offering help, um, therapy. His grades just plummeted, uh, four Ds. His, his GPA was so high that he graduated with honors after four Ds. Um, he just went downhill. Um, threatened if I didn't pay his uh, rent that he was going to kill my dog. He actually came and kidnapped my dog and um, threatened to kill her. It, anyway, it was um, a horrible time. And now he was the drug dealer. Here he is at uh, 18. We found these photos on his phone after he died in Snapchat. Be aware that Snapchat is used for drug deals. Um, these were in his, you know, for your eyes only section of Snapchat, look at the age. I, I tried to blur their faces, but these are very, very young um, children. No medical issues, okay? Johnny was very healthy. Um, so he was able to obtain a med card. Um, we don't know exactly how, um, but we did find his old login to his med card account. And here's a photo of him um, Snapchatting. Anyone, uh, he's even got a typo in here, want to smoke me up before I med card. Um, not a shock, I guess, when you're high. And these are actual photos uh, from his Snapchat. You can see the crystal in here. Uh, he says, hit me up, strand his Girl Scouts. Uh, here's some dab, here's some, um, some joints. He's got shatter. So this is what drug dealing looks like in a high school. There is, a, as soon as the, the seniors in Colorado turn 18, they all go get their med cards by making up some lie uh, about they have a migraine or something that can't be uh, proven. And then sadly, they're selling it now to, just like Johnny was 14, using as a freshman uh, and even in middle school, very sadly. So when you look at medical marijuana. Look at um, in Colorado, these are the actual state records I got a hold of uh, in November of 2020, okay? We had um, 131 children ages zero to 10 who needed a med card. Now these are debilitating illnesses. We do not want to take away um, legitimate FDA approved uh, um, med medicine, right? We also don't want to take away um, the, the medicine that is helping, I use that in terms of seizures, um, cancer. I, I have written personally with mothers whose children by using um, drops with THC in them, very low THC and a lot of CBD, um, ca the cannabidiol, which is the non-intoxicating form of marijuana. 
um, as Kevin Sabat said earlier, um, there are components that can be helpful. And so to these 131 children that this medical marijuana is helping, we don't wanna take away from that. And then um, from 11 to 17, there are 140 children um, who have cancer, who have pain from anorexia, you know, a lot of um, uses of this that their parents say is very helpful to them uh, because of their conditions. Um, but look what happens magically overnight um, from ages 17 to 18, 3,900. So there's this gap uh, where at 18, legally, you can get your medical marijuana card they suddenly developed a debilitating illness overnight from age 17, 364 days to age 18. Um, so that means there are some doctors, um, doctors who are out there prescribing. Um, in other words, they give them $300, you go to a pot doc, you get your med card and you're, you're in. Um, so you don't have to wait until you're 21. Problem? Brains are still forming, big, big problem. So you can't get tobacco or alcohol legally, but you can get a medical marijuana card. Oh yeah, and the parents don't know and don't have to approve. Um, the physician doesn't have to write you a prescription because it's not a prescription, right? They don't take it to a pharmacy. They don't say what you should take, how you should take it, how much you should take, how often you should take it, how long you, no, none of that. You just take your new shiny med card um, to any dispensary and get anything you want. Um, there's no requirement to follow up. Um, you can uh, talk to the bud tender who is trained to sell you the highest potency uh, possible. When you're a medical marijuana patient, oh, bonus, even better, because you can purchase twice as much um, medical versus the recreational dispensaries, one versus two ounces a day. And it's less expensive because you have lower tax and there's no tracking. So our teens here in Colorado go from one dispensary by two grams, another dispensary by two grams, another. They have all of their product that they need to sell right there. Folks, there's no black market. They're not they're not um, getting these illegally from dispensaries. They're not approaching homeless people out on the street, giving them a fiver, trying to get them to go in and buy them. They're getting it themselves and it's causing huge problems. And guess what? We don't even know who the doctor is that gave Johnny the fake medical marijuana card that he didn't need uh, because you can't find out who gave it to them. Under Colorado law, they are protected. Uh, it's their name is not on the med card. And when you log in, you can't see who they are. Um, so you you pay your 500 bucks, you go in, you get your med card and you get this, you are allowed to go buy weed. Um, so that's what's happening. And that is the reality. When you look at um, the comparison uh, in Colorado on mental and substance abuse uh, disorders associated with marijuana use. This is the national versus Colorado data. This is from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health from 2019. Look at the first chart. In the past month, uh, marijuana uses ages 18 to 25, nationally 23%, in Colorado 37%, right? Past year use, 7.5 national to Colorado, 14.8. This is actual statistical data. Um, so don't let anybody tell you that marijuana use does not go up in legalized states. That's baloney. It absolutely, absolutely goes up. It also doesn't help with other drugs. Guess what? The number one predictor now is of whether a youth will abuse opioids in the next 30 days in high school lifetime marijuana use. That's right. Um, the fourth bar there, lifetime marijuana use. This is from the Centers for Disease Control Youth Risk Behavioral Study. In 2019, it is more than a previous 30-day alcohol use that predicts whether or not a teen will use opioids in the next 30 days. So guess what? Marijuana, lifetime marijuana use, the new official gateway to other drugs. This is from uh, one of our scientific advisory board members, Dr. Ken Finn, um, looking at drug deaths. The, uh, we were promised that it was going to reduce all the other drug problems. Well, look at this graph in 2014 uh, and what started happening. 
with everything else, opioids, fentanyl, meth, cocaine, heroin, everything. So uh, who's to blame? Who's to blame for Johnny's death? Well, I blamed myself uh, for a long time. I have a lot of regrets. I share a lot about that in my upcoming book, but bottom line, I didn't make him make him use marijuana. I tried to help him. We tried to get him to stop. And at some point you cannot control another human being. You can't duct tape them to the wall or chain yourself to them. And and I didn't push him off the building that killed him. Um, did Johnny, was Johnny to blame? Well, you know, Johnny did kill himself. Um, yes, but the marijuana made him psychotic. Johnny wasn't actually in his right mind, of course, um, when he died. Was it the marijuana's fault? Well, you know, it's kind of like saying if, if someone dies by a gunshot, that it's the gun's fault. Um, the, the gun has to have the trigger pulled. As marijuana itself is, 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 a, is a plant in, in inert on its own. Um, this is who I blame. I blame all of these people, these carpetbaggers, these money mongers, uh, these predators who go after our children, uh, who are billionaires, who are funding um, the pro pot. I blame all of the pro cannabis industry leaders and all of the uh, directors of associations who are out there, lobbyists, attorneys, people who are trying to make this drug legal because they need our children um, to profit, make no uh, uncertainty about that. Uh, addiction is an adolescent onset disease. It is uh, more rare for someone to become an addict when they are an adult if that use did not start uh, when they were a youth. And Johnny graduated uh, from high school in, in May of 2019. He did attend CSU on his scholarship. He dabbed for two weeks nonstop. He texted me and he told me he felt like killing himself. So obviously we withdrew him from the university. That was his first um, hospital stay. They let him out after three days. I begged them not to, and he did attempt um, to kill himself first. He recovered. Uh, we got him out of the hospital once the THC had exited his body um, and he recovered. He was sober. Uh, he was home until December and he decided, you know, I think I'm ready to try again. I'm sober. I'm going to go back to school. Uh, and he did. We, we sent him to the University of Northern um, Colorado and sadly went right back to the crowd um, using marijuana when he wasn't here with us and this time he had a psychotic break. Um, he actually called me uh, and said, uh, this is, these are his actual journals um, that he was set up by the mob, um, his phone was tapped, the, the University of Northern Colorado was a military base, um, that they thought he was an FBI uh, informant, that he was a terrorist or that you know they were after him. Um, he said the whole world knows about me. This is what psychosis looks like um, for marijuana. Johnny did not have psychosis before he started using marijuana. He did not have mental illness. He was not depressed. Um, I want everyone to see the diagnosis the doctor gave him when he, was, when he left the hospital, THC abuse severe. This is Johnny's medical um, diagnosis. And I want you to go through um, this handout that you have for this session look up these studies. We know from research, from hard evidence, that marijuana can cause psychosis. Um, there's a great researcher in London, Sir Robin Murray, who was the pioneer in the forefront of a lot of these um, uh, studies, and I was really blessed to have him on Johnny's Ambassadors. Please watch his webinar, um, but also to be emailing with him, and I asked him about the connection. Uh, between marijuana and psychosis. And he said, you know, look at it this way. You can have a heart attack because you have a heavy genetic loading if you exercise a lot. Um, or you can have no genetic loading. You can still have a heart attack because you never exercise and you get fat. But it's easiest to have a heart attack if you have genetic loading and you get very fat. So his research showed very similarly, you can develop schizophrenia because you have a heavy genetic loading. That makes sense, even if you never use marijuana. But even if you have no genetic loading, you can develop schizophrenia because you use a lot of marijuana. And it's easiest to develop schizophrenia if you have genetic loading and use marijuana. So all of those things are possible. And I hope 
um, by reading through some of those studies that you see that. So what happened? He uh, recovered. Again, he stopped using marijuana. He became sober. He was on uh, antipsychotic to uh, help with the delusional thinking. He got a job, uh, rented a room in a home, uh, moved to, uh, then changed jobs, moved to one of our condos um, down the street that John and I have. He got a new job at PetSmart. He tried another university. We went to Colorado Technical University this time. Uh, we got him a new puppy. Everything was fabulous and sadly, reunited with an old girlfriend who herself dabbed every day. She punched him in the face. Um, he had a really uh, kind of a come to Jesus uh, moment. He quit marijuana. He quit smoking nicotine and unfortunately quit his antipsychotic too soon. Um, he made a very valiant attempt to be sober. Uh, this is October of 2019. He talked to a friend. This is from his phone that we got into. Uh, notice the very last line. I don't have anything to prove to people whose main personality trait is smoking a drug. So he was sober uh, for five weeks. Unfortunately, the psychosis did not go away uh, and he was not using his antipsychotics. He came to our home three days before he died for dinner. And he told me, I just want you to know that you were right. <laughs> All along, you told me marijuana would hurt my brain and it's ruined my mind and my life and I'm sorry and I love you. And three days later, he jumped off a building. This is his Snapchat right before he died. He took a photo of his odometer on his car and it said 133661 was his mileage. And in a Snapchat, he typed 133661 and he typed, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction for one extreme to exist. There must be the opposing. What does that mean? It means nothing. The, the, he, he was psychotic. He had clearly um, a psychotic episode, um, which drove him to this. Um, so please know there is a connection between marijuana and suicide. Again, um, I encourage you to go look at the research um, to these things. In Colorado, from 2014, look what started to happen to suicide rates. They are climbing uh, and they're going higher. And in fact, in 2018, 36% of all toxicology from children, teens, ages 15 through 19, had THC in their system, not alcohol. Look at alcohol is. Uh, much lower with the blue uh, as the primary drug found in their toxicology. So repeated cannabis use interferes with the development of their mind. Marijuana impacts mental development. Um, even though it's illegal, even proponents of marijuana acknowledge this science. So this loophole um, for medical ages 18 to 20 to get these medical cards makes this much worse um, they, they can't get cigarettes or alcohol, you know, but this can sometimes called the gray market is a huge problem. And our youth are becoming psychotic and dying by suicide uh, at very alarming rates. And not just that, but it, it, the depression, uh, the anxiety, the dropping out of school, the motive, a motivational syndrome, uh, the, the problems with IQ, the bipolar, the, the schizophrenia, all of the things that are happening as a result. So I'll close with just a few kind of final um, thoughts. Start talking about marijuana early, very young. Uh, get educated, know the risks short term, long term, and have absolutely firm no use rules. Parents are so influential. Your, your children are listening to you. Surveys show that. Um, and many of them are using it just because they're curious. Um, just because they want to know what it's like to get high and you need to tell them the damage that it will do to their brain and make it very clear it is not allowed. Um, keep talking so that you can help them. There, We have webinars on emotional intelligence and motivational interviewing techniques for your children. Keep track of them. Know where they are. Know what's on their phones. Make it very clear that you have access um, to their phones. If they are ever in trouble, you have a pick you up anywhere, anytime, no questions asked. 
Um, monitor your own behavior. Be very careful about celebrating with with substances, um, with alcohol. Don't we don't want them to inadvertently learn that when you celebrate, you use a drug or you use wine or you use something. Um, you 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 know teach them healthy habits. They they're really watching. Um, help them plan when they have social pressure to use. Teach them what to say and never provide your child with marijuana in any amount. No use of marijuana is safe um, to the developing mind and, and teach them refusal skills. We use the three S method here um, at Johnny's Ambassadors. State your reasons, teach your teens this. My parents drug test me, that's a great excuse. I don't wanna mess up my brain, I'm driving, whatever. Second S, suggest, why don't we go do this? Let's do this instead. Maybe this would be fun and stick to your boundaries. Seriously, I don't want it. Uh, I don't want to disappoint my folks. Or hey, if you keep bugging me, I'm out of here. Um, so that's what we're trying to do here at Johnny's Ambassadors. You know, I use this quote, um, I'm gonna forge ahead despite my pain and try to give some meaning to this loss. Um, the work we're doing here at Johnny's Ambassadors, we hope you uh, join us, become an ambassador. Uh, we have all sorts of ways that you can join us. and. We're trying to teach a healthy fear of marijuana. You know, why did you teach your kids to be worried and scared about rattlesnakes? Because they can bite you. <laughs> and so can marijuana. Um, we encourage you to uh, join us. We gratefully accept your donations. Uh, we have a newsletter every week. We'd love for you to uh, sign up. We did sign everybody up on this, uh, web, on this webinar series so that you can stay in touch with us. Uh, we have a very active Facebook group of about 1,400 ambassadors. Uh, we have a Stop Dabbing Walk coming up that we do. Uh, this will be our second annual. We use hashtag Stop Dabbing. Uh, StopDabbingWalk.com is September 19th, 2021 this year. So please uh, join us in your own neighborhood or even your backyard. And if you go to johnny'sambassadors.org slash join, um, you can find out all sorts of uh, different ways to join us. Um, this is a QR code here. If you scan this with your phone, you can get uh, more information on how to uh, get involved uh, with Johnny's Ambassadors. Let's see, a couple quick comments here. Prayers for you, Laura. Thank you and love. Thank you so much. Um, great visuals on the brain synapses and pruning. Yes, I tried to create something really understandable with like the jungle um, so that that could be really helpful um, to you. Uh, we try to control TV, cell phone, internet, et cetera. It's next to impossible seeing all these products for a parent to know. And we have, we've got it. I mean, yes, I didn't know either. I get it. Uh, we, we must educate ourselves. Uh, we had one webinar from a detective um, that I encourage you to watch who said, never let your child charge his or her phone in their own room overnight. Um, that's where a lot of the problems are happening. They, he said, always charge your child's phone in your room. T teens, yes, and they're gonna go, oh, I need it for my alarm. Well, I'm gonna buy you an alarm clock. Um, wow, what a newfangled device um, so that you can get up and that um, until they are 18 years old, they are not in, this is a, a, a privilege. Uh, that they have to use the phone and that you will be able to get into their phone at any time as a condition of being able to use it. Um, that there are fake apps. You know, there's an app that looks like a calculator um, that's actually a, a, a cannabis site. So there's all kinds of things that we need to understand and get educated about um, as parents as well. Uh, Laura, great uh, presentation. Uh, Tyler here. Hi, Tyler from Oswego County Prevention Coalition in upstate New York, happy to be here. Our local surveys indicate that perception of risk associated with marijuana uh, for high school students that is an all time low. Yes, it is true because of the false narrative, because of the marketing, uh, because of the media, because of the normalization of marijuana. Sadly, the teen's perception of risk is going lower, lower, lower. What that means is that use is going higher, higher, higher because they no longer think, oh, it's no problem. So we really have to do a good job educating about um, the harms. And you know what, They, if you just explain to them, uh, the neuroscience, show them on some of these recordings. I do uh, teen presentations. I have recordings of teen uh, presentations. They really do appreciate being talked to 
uh, in a way that is not, um, you should not do this, right? Tell them why. Um, and we have a new curriculum uh, that we have just launched today. If you go to johnny'sambassadors.org slash curriculum, it's a new online uh, training for teens. And that is our whole goal, Tyler, is to really reduce that gap in the perception between the actual and the perceived harm of marijuana. We really do have to make sure they understand um, how much uh, harm can come from this. Um, thank you, Laura. So happy for the great work that you're doing. Happy to be involved. Thank you. Um, Johnny was like my son. Sorry. I'm so grateful um, to you for sharing your story. I'm so relieved uh, and happy that I found your website and excellent resources. I'm hopeful that awareness will grow um, thanks to your tireless work uh, and amazing strength, character, humor. Wow. Thank you all. That's, uh, that is so very kind um, to hear. Uh, so we are going to um, take our break now while I get our next presenter um, set up. So everybody go ahead and uh, take a 15 minute break until 10 o'clock and I'm going to get Joe McGuire uh, set up here on the line. All right, we'll be back everyone.